today we finish out the book of Genesis, man. We're done, church. We're done. We're fin- man, come on. I hope that's a woo. God was good, not a woo. Thank God. We've been in Genesis. For those of you who are, who are new, this is your first Sunday with us. Uh, we, we've been in the book of Genesis now for a year and a half, journeying chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through this incredible book of the Bible, the first book of the Bible. And for us as a church, we, we feel led by the Lord just for us to uh, work our way through books of the Bible, preach what we call the, what the scriptures call the full counsel of God. And so uh, we have been in Genesis now for a season and today that season ends and, and next Sunday we begin a, uh, a four week series that we call uh, Christ Culture and Community that we're really, really excited about launching our small groups and uh, missional community groups as we call them. And then, and then in four weeks we will begin a brand new uh, series through the Gospel of John. I say all that to say if you're new uh, this morning, this is a really good time uh, to, to plug in here at Emmaus if you're looking for a church home. We, we are thrilled that you're here if you are new, and we encourage you to do two things. One, take that Connect card in your bulletin, fill that out. There's a little box here that says you're a new visitor. We'd love for you to check that off and, and let us know that you're here. Drop that in the basket at the end of the service so uh, we can follow up with you this next week and maybe email you, give you a call, let you know how thrilled we are that you would worship with us here at Emmaus uh, this morning. The second thing we would invite you to do is, is we got a welcome center right out here in, in the lobby, folks, that uh, look for the blue E that the it's on the desk and, and go up there and we've got some uh, host and hostesses there who just want to give you a, a gift and say hello and shake your hand and, and, and uh, tell you how thrilled we are, again, that you'd join us today. Uh, Genesis chapter 50, I'm going to pray. We're not going to do any preliminary stuff. We're just going to dive in. We're going to book in this series that God has had us in uh, for a year and a half. I will say this, man, I, I was... There's a brother uh, who goes here uh, to Emmaus, and, and he was praying for me. He prays for me every every Sunday before uh, the first service, before I preach, and um, and which is a gift, man. And, and he was praying this over me uh, earlier before first service. I thought it was so beautiful, and and I, and I feel like it's it should be our sentiment. He, he said he was praying. He said he said Lord, uh, he said Lord, would it not be that we have been through? the book of Genesis, would it be that the book of Genesis has been through us? And I love that, man. This idea of God's word, dwelling in God's word, marinating ourselves in God's word and having the Lord transform us over time. And I pray and hope uh, that that's been our experience as a church body. Uh, So let's pray and let's do this. Genesis chapter 50. And Father, I do, I, I thank you for how faithful, good you've been to us. Um, Lord, over, man, a year and a half now, Lord. I thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity for us uh, today to once again uh, be in your word and to hear from you and to, uh, Lord, to, 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 to submit ourselves, to yield ourselves to you, King Jesus. And right now, uh, Lord, once again, we declare that you are the senior pastor of this church. You are the chief shepherd, Lord. You have led us so faithfully and so well uh, for a long time now, and, and you will continue to do that. Thank you for how you've led us, uh, Lord, through your word and how you've instructed us through your word. And Lord, help us to not take it for granted, God. I know so often I do, man. And just the fact that I have in front of me this, this incredible book that is not just any other book. It's, it's the word of the living God. It's, it's the heart of God revealed to me, laid bare for all of us that we might know you. That our lives might be changed by you. And I pray that that's what has happened, Lord, not only in the past year and a half as we've walked through Genesis as a church body, but Lord, as we continue just to every week, gather together to say, Lord, speak. Speak to your servant. Speak to us, Lord. We we long for you. Your word is sweeter than honey on our lips. And Lord, would you continue to speak, nurture, grow, instruct? Lord, I thank you for this morning. Would you speak to your servant now? And I pray it all through Christ. Amen. Amen. So y'all ready to do this? Everybody good? Ready? All right, let's do this then. Um, So here's the deal, Mayus. I'll I'll start this way. Um, One of the one of the things that uh, they uh, teach you in seminary, they, those people, uh, teach you in seminary and, uh, and even in like pastoral leadership books that, that you'll get and, and you'll read through is, is, is this. Uh, one of the things that you read or that you hear often as a pastor and as, and as you're, you're kind of learning is, is that uh, a lot of people say, um, they give you wisdom that says um, what's important for a pastor or for a minister is that you have a hobby. 
So I say it's very important that you have a hobby, that, that as a pastor of a church or a pastor or a minister in, in some ministry, you have a hobby. And the reason they say that is because they say, look, man, uh, kind of the nature of what, what you do every day is, is sort of always fluid and it never ends. And Sunday's always a coming, right? And there's always more sermons that need to be preached and more people that, that need to meet Jesus. And, and so as a result, if you're not careful, they say that it can, it can seem like sort of you're on this, you know, never ending uh, treadmill. And, and so, so one of the pieces of wisdom, one of the nuggets of wisdom you hear is, is look, what you need is, you need a hobby that you can, something that you can begin, you, you can do, you can see it through to completion, you can be done, and you can say, wow, that was great, and they say, you need that because uh, the nature of what you do every other day is, is so not like that, right? So, um, I, for, a long, for a long time, it, it was really difficult for me to find a hobby. Uh, I don't know why, but first of all, I I'm unlike most pastors in America, being that I despise golf. Um, I can't stand it. And, and mostly because I'm terrible at it, right? Like, like, like the, the moments that I've been golfing, and some of you guys know because you've, you've invited me to golf and you, you live to regret it, right? Is, is, is that most of the time I, I spend most of the afternoon just kind of, you know, walking around in 90 degree heat, chasing a little white ball in the sand pits and not my idea of a good time. And, and so that was, early on, that became obvious that was not gonna be my hobby. And, uh, and by the way, it's expensive too, and I'm poor. And so we're not gonna have golf as a hobby. And then, and then, Hunting is never going to happen. I mean, look at me, right? I, I'm not a, why, why, why are you laughing? Um, but I'm not a hunter per se, right? And not that I'm, I don't have anything against hunting. Like, like I think it's great. I, I think deer is delicious and birds keep shooting them because they're good. But, but I, I, just, I just don't do it, right? And so I, I'm not into uh, hunting. And, and so uh, I found a, a hobby recently and it was a gift uh, because my wife uh, my amazing wife, uh, for my birthday, purchased me a telescope. And y'all, it's, it's awesome. And I, I know what some of y'all are thinking. Uh, some of y'all hear me say telescope, and uh, immediately you think, wow, you're a nerd, right? Um, but, but here's how I would respond to that. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> and I'm proud. Right? I wear my nerd badge with confidence, man. Like, I don't care. I don't mind being a nerd, and I can accept reality. I own a telescope that looks up into the stars, which means I'm like one step away from owning a fanny pack and, you know, listening to polka, but I'm cool with that. I'm good with that. I'm, I'm secure, and y'all, I'm telling you, man, this, this telescope has been amazing. Like, it's, it's awesome. Like, matter of fact, I've even gone a step further because uh, now I'm like, I'm reading books on astronomy, right? I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in, in like what's, you know, the stars and the planets and, and I'm reading blogs on, on astronomy and, and I've, I've recently like, I, I've even been surfing the, the website for the, for the Mars rover to, to, to look at the red rocks that are up on uh, the planet Mars and I even, got, I even got like this app on my phone called the Star Map where you can leave, it's amazing, man, because you, you pull up the Star Map and you do like this and like it, it shows you, like, like what, what's out there. So you, it points, you point over here and Saturn's over here. It shows you exactly where Saturn is. You point it over here. It shows you where these stars are. And it's incredible, man. And so I've been, I've been doing this with my time. And, and the other night I even saw Saturn. Like I saw Saturn and, and like the rings around Saturn and, and like it's 746 million miles away from Earth. It's just like floating through the air, right? And, and, and my wife thought I was crazy because I said, baby, come look at this. It's awesome. And she ran over and then sure enough, a cloud went in front of Saturn and she's looking can see, I see nothing, right? And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to show her. So it's absolutely amazing. Matter of fact, it was funny because we went, we went to Uganda a few weeks ago with the Uganda missions team. Uh, there was one night we're at this hotel having dinner, like the last night we were there, and they took us there for this dinner. And it was like this field next to this hotel, and y'all should see it, like because in Uganda, man, you're, you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. They got no, they don't have the lights that we do here. And so you look at that. I've never seen a sky like this, man. Like the sky just filled with stars. It's like little dots of fire everywhere, and, and we're out there, a few members of the team were out there in this field, and, and uh, all of a sudden, I started giving a space lecture, right? So, so, so I'm talking to them, going, hey, guys, you see that? You see that right there? That's, that's Venus right there. That's Venus, and, and over there next to it, that's Jupiter. Isn't that awesome? That, that's Jupiter, and, and if you look at that twinkly one over here, that's, that's, that's Saturn right there. That, that's Saturn, and, and, and over here, the big, the big white one, that, that, that's called the moon, right? And that's, it's amazing, and, right? So I'm acting like I'm smart. I'm acting like I know what I'm talking about, 
And they're all going, wow, man, this is, uh, the pastor's really schooled up on space. Now, what they didn't know is the only reason I knew that is because I had my app open, right? And so I'm looking through my space app and seeing where things are, but it, but it was absolutely amazing. And I'm telling you, here's the point of this. Owning this telescope for me, it's weird because it's kind of brought this brand new perspective. And it has caused me even to, to look at kind of the heavens and, and the universe we live in a, in a different way because, because I understand the night sky has always been beautiful. It's always been glorious. But the problem is, typically, I just kind of took it for granted and never even like pay attention. But, but here's the point, church. When, when you take a closer look, follow this. When you take a closer look, right, and when you focus in on it, you, you, begin, you begin to see that it's, it's far more beautiful than you ever realized, right? Now, here's, here's why I tell you that, church. For over a year and a half now, we, we've, we've been zooming in, focusing in on this one book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the very first book in God's word. And we've been following through on this journey. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we have seen some of the most extraordinary, uh, magnificent events you will ever read about in the scriptures, man in the book of Genesis. So, 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 so back a year and a half ago, man, we started him and we saw, we had this moment where we saw God create the universe. Like he spoke it into existence and it's a different kind of creation. He didn't, he didn't just like take stuff that already existed like we do and then make something. It's, it's that kind of Hebrew word, baraha, which, which literally says he, he spoke it into existence. He spoke nothing into something. So we saw this amazing moment where God speaks and there's stars and there's planets and there's a universe universe and, and then we saw we saw the first marriage you remember that the first marriage where where God creates uh, Adam and, and he creates Eve out of a rib from his side and then we have this amazing moment in Genesis chapter 2 verse 26 where God actually brings the woman to the man he gives her away in the very first wedding and it's beautiful and magnis magnificent and we saw Adam and Eve rebel against God in the garden and we saw the curse of sin enter into the world and then we saw God promise to send a savior who would one day destroy sin and crush the head of the devil and we saw a worldwide flood that wiped out sinners and then we saw God save a very tiny remnant of people through that flood and preserve them and rescue them. And then we saw God choose one family through whom he will fulfill this promise to send a savior. And then we, we've seen how incredibly jacked and broken and dysfunctional this family is. And yet, we've seen how unbelievably faithful God is to this family of broken sinners, even though they're a, they're a hot mess of people and they're crazier than a bag of cats. God is constantly pursuing them. He's constantly faithful to them. He's constantly running them down. He's constantly showing them his love. And, and now, family, watch this. Now, after a year and a half in this incredible book, after a year and a half, after 50 chapters, and after what's for us here to, as a church been over 60 hours of sermons, we, we have now finally arrived at the end, the very last chapter of Genesis. And, and as your pastor, here's what I hope and pray. Honestly, here's what I hope and pray. I, I hope, y'all understand, our aim in preaching through a book like this is never just so that you might know more things about a book of the Bible, right? That's not the, that's not the point, Instead, family, the, the point of this is that, that hopefully, by God's grace, after a year and a half of journeying through this book of the Bible, hopefully you'll be able to say, you know what, man? I love King Jesus more today than I did a year and a half ago. And family, I'm telling you, like if you're able to stand here today and honestly say, I'm more in love with Jesus now than I was a year and a half ago, that's the win. That's the win. So with that being said, let's dive in. Genesis 50, verse 1. And I can already tell it's going to be a fun day because I'm sweating. It's going to be great. Genesis 50, verse 1. And real quick, for those of you who are brand new, just, just in case you've maybe, you know, maybe you've missed a few of these sermons or maybe you're new here today and you, you haven't been around, I would first of all tell you that every single one of these talks, these sermons are available on, online and, and we have that podcast. We'd encourage you to catch up, to listen, to, 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 to immerse yourself in the book of Genesis. But here's what you need to know. Just now walking in today, maybe you're just now getting plugged back in, you've been gone on a three-month vacation for summer and you're getting ready for school. Here, here's what you need to know. When we get to Genesis chapter 50, for about half of the book of Genesis, 
For about 50% of the book of Genesis, we've been focused in on this brother named Jacob and and Jacob's family. And then there comes a point in the book of Genesis where where the focus shifts from Jacob to one of Jacob's sons, a man named Joseph. And maybe you're here this morning, you're not real familiar with Joseph's story, you're not real schooled on on who Joseph is. And so real quick, I'll give you the 30-second Reader's Digest version of of Joseph's story. Here's what you need to know about Joseph. Um, Joseph's life has been very similar to the Tilt-A-Whirl ride at the State Fair, right? It's been crazy. It's been, it's been round and round and up and down. And here's what I mean. When Joseph was 17 years old, just 17 years old, his older brothers decided to betray him and sell him into slavery in Egypt because they were jealous of him because he was their daddy's favorite son. Which means Joseph was a slave, And then Joseph is eventually accused of rape by Potiphar's crazy wife. And then Joseph is thrown into prison where he is forced to suffer in prison for 13 years for a crime he did not even come close to committing. You imagine that, 13 years in jail for a crime you did not commit. And then Joseph is miraculously released from prison after he interprets Pharaoh's dreams for him. And then Joseph is promoted by Pharaoh to be the second most powerful cat in all of Egypt, really the the known world. And, And then after over 20 years of not seeing his backstabbing, conniving, betraying brothers, Joseph is finally, in a very awkward way, reunited with them after they come to Egypt to look for food in the midst of a famine. And then to make a long story extremely short, we had this beautiful moment where Joseph is actually reconciled with his daddy, his long lost daddy, who he hasn't seen for a couple decades. And he's, he's reconciled with his brothers who, who betrayed him so long ago. And for 17 years, follow this man, for 17 years, they're able to live together in Egypt like one happy family. It's like a dream come true. It's like the end of a lifetime movie. It's beautiful. It's glorious. It's wonderful. After all those years of pain, the family's reunited. But then as we saw last week, eventually in Genesis chapter 49, Joseph's father Jacob dies. And that brings us to Genesis 50. The final chapter of our journey through Genesis is a time of grieving. It's a time of mourning. It's a time of weeping. Joseph loved his daddy, Jacob. And yet Jacob had his issues. And we've unpacked a lot of them in here. And Jacob was flawed. And Jacob was a sinner. And Jacob was a total wreck. But church family, listen to me. There's something about a son and his daddy. And he loves his father. And he's grieving. And then we get to verse 1. Genesis 50. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Okay, so follow this closely. Here's why this is such a big deal, Emmaus. Follow this. Um, What we see is that right out of the gate, Joseph has to do what many of you in this room have had to do before. Joseph has to bury his daddy. Joseph has to bury one of his parents. And some of you know this pain all too well. You've walked through this. We all will at some point. Verse two. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father, watch this, my father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, go up and bury your father as he made you swear, verse seven. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and all his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. Verse 10. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamenting, lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. 
When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the morning on the threshing floor of Atab, they said, this is a grievous morning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus the sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite to, the, to, to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Now, let's unpack what just happened because this is really important, okay? You have to understand the significance of what we just read because it would be very easy to just kind of pass over this and think it's no big deal. Jacob died, they went, they buried him somewhere in Canaan and we're done. But you have to understand what's so significant about this moment right here, family. So so according to the text, according to Genesis 49, where we were last week, and according to this right here, Genesis chapter 50, what we read that that, that uh, that Joseph's father Jacob, when he was on his deathbed, had one dying wish. Okay, follow this. He's on his deathbed. He's about to die. He has one dying wish. And according to the Bible, his one dying wish is this. Like Jacob at this moment, he has this moment where he looks up at his sons who were surrounding his deathbed, and he says, guys, listen, I'm about to die. I know I'm about to die. I'm about to die. But listen to me. When I die, don't you bury me here in Egypt because there's this land that God has promised to our people. There's a very special place that God has promised to give to our people. And so I want you to bury me there. Don't bury me here in Egypt. You take me to that land that God has promised to give to our people someday. You take me there and you bury me there. In other words, follow this. In other words, family, what Jacob was saying was this, man. Jacob was saying, look, um, Egypt is not my home. My home is where God says my home is. And I may live in Egypt, and I may have a house in Egypt, and, and I may wear clothes that were made in Egypt, and I may hang out with people that are from Egypt, and I may care very deeply about the people who are living right here in Egypt. But let me be clear, man. Even though I may live in Egypt, I am not of Egypt. You follow that, church? Like, I live here, I dwell here, I breathe the air here, I do trade here, I buy stuff here, I eat food here, but I am not of Here, Egypt is not my home. Egypt is not my God. Which means Egypt does not decide and determine what my values are going to be. Egypt is not where my citizenship is. You follow that? So he says, don't you bury me here in Egypt when I die, but instead you bury me in that land that God promised to our people. And some of you, here's the deal. Some of you are listening to this and you're Bible people. You love the Bible, you study the Bible, you spend time in the Bible, you read the Bible, you absolutely love the Bible. And by the way, that's not derogatory in any way. That is a beautiful thing and we should all be Bible people. And some of you who are Bible people who study the Bible, like, like you hear me talk about this right now. And as even you hear me talk about this, there's something going off in your mind and in your heart and you're thinking to yourself, wow, this, this kind of, kind of sounds like something I've heard before. This sort of sounds familiar. This sort of sounds, this kind of rings a bell. And, and if that's what you're thinking, I would just say, you are correct, sir. Because Paul, this is awesome. I love the Bible. Watch this. Philippians chapter three, years later, centuries later, the apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Philippi would write this in Philippians chapter three, verse 17. Listen to what the apostle Paul writes. He writes to followers of Jesus about what it looks like to, to be a follower of Jesus in a, in a world that, that often is, is hostile to followers of Jesus, right? Not a whole lot has changed since Paul's day, right? No, no, watch what Paul says. It's awesome. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame. With minds set on earthly things. Watch this. But our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is where, church? Church. 
One more time, it's where? One, a third time, it's where? Don't miss this. Our citizenship is in heaven. Some, many, have their minds on earthly things, but focused on earthly things. But not us, man, not us. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, from, from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. Translation, if you were a follower of Jesus, if you love Jesus, your heart belongs to Jesus, your faith is in Jesus today, then according to the scriptures, one of the core convictions that should drive your life on a daily basis is this right here. Much like Egypt was not Jacob's home, this world is not your home. But instead, because, watch this, instead, but because of the fact that Jesus Christ has graciously rescued you from hell and from death and from wrath, your citizenship is in heaven. And again, man, I don't think I can, I can't overemphasize this enough. This is not simply a theological belief that, that, that those of us who are Christians should like assent to. Because that's the problem. The problem is some of us, we, we go, yes, I, I agree with that, but in our practice, in our lives, there's a disconnect, right? This isn't just some, some, some theological idea I should agree with. Instead, church, follow this. This is a core conviction that should drive the decisions I make in my life on a daily basis. This idea that, man, this world is not my home, and I know there's gonna be tension, and I know people aren't gonna agree with the decisions I make often, and, and I know I'm gonna be labeled names and, and, and labeled, you know, a bit and, and narrow-minded at times, but I'm telling you, man, here I stand. I can do no other. This world is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven, which means I may live in this world, and I may raise my family in this world, and I may pay a mortgage on a house in this world, and I may have a career in this world, and I may root for a college football team in this world, go dogs, and I may wear clothes that are created by fashion designers who live in this world. Thank you, Old Navy. But the reality is, my ultimate, follow this, my ultimate citizenship is not in this world. My ultimate citizenship is in heaven under the reign of King Jesus. Which means, there are implications to this, follow this, that there are real, implica- real life implications to this church. Because what that means is this, if my home is, if my citizenship is not in this world, but rather it is with King Jesus, then that means that my values, my values that drive the way I desire to raise my family, the way I desire to do life with my kids and my wife, the way I desire to do life in relationship and everything else, my, my values cannot be determined by anyone or anything in this world apart from Jesus. My values will not be determined by the majority of the people who live in this world. My values will not be determined by the celebrities who live in this world or by the presidents who rule in this world or by nine courts who judge on a court in this world or by the terrorists who threaten me with death in this world. But instead, as a citizen of heaven who according to Philippians chapter three is awaiting that glorious day when King Jesus will part the heavens and come back to his church to rule and to reign in glory, my values will only be determined by King Jesus. Jesus, because Egypt is not my home. You follow this? You got to understand, this is not just a moment where Jacob said, yeah, bury me over there. They got better sunshine. That is not what's going on. This is a foreshadowing of what would happen with the church. Your home is not this world, church. Your citizenship's in heaven. Now look at verse 15. Watch this, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, "Uh uh-oh, which isn't here. I just, I think that's in the Hebrew. It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. 
Right, so, so you got to pay attention to what, what just happened to your family. So, so, so again, do the math. Their daddy's dead. And now they're kind of getting nervous. They're sweating a little bit. They're kind of freaking out a little bit because, because these guys realize that like a light bulb finally goes off of these guys. And these guys go, hold up. Wait, 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 wait a minute for a second. Hold on. Um, sure, everything was fine while daddy was alive. Sure, while daddy was alive, Joseph said he forgave us for selling him into slavery 40 years ago. Sure, he said things were cool. Sure, he said that he extended us grace. But, but what if that was just a show? What if Joseph was only saying that because daddy was alive and he knew if he wiped all us out in one fell swoop that daddy's heart would be broken? Like, like, like what, if, what if Joseph is Michael Corleone and we're Fredo? For those of you who are culturally, culturally savvy, Right? Like, what if, what if he's just wait, been waiting for that moment for daddy to be out of the way so that he can put out the hit, kill us, and, and, and get us back? What, what if? So, so follow, follow what's going on. In other, words, in other words, what's happening is this, church family, th- these guys are trembling in fear. You know why? Because they know that they're guilty. And they know that, that if we're going off what they deserve, they deserve to be punished. Okay, so watch what happens next, man. Watch verse 16. Here's what they do. So, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, um, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. All right, so in other words, out of fear for their lives, according to the text here, Joseph's brothers decide to conjure up a lie. Because, because have you ever noticed, church, have you ever noticed when we get scared, we do really goofy, stupid things? Anybody amen to that, right? We get scared, we get nervous, life gets uncertain, immediately we kind of go into freak out mode and we do some crazy junk. I mean, that's, that's how it works. That's how this sin nature works. And so these guys get afraid, so they decide, in, in response to their fear, they decide to make up a lie. And that's what this is. It's a lie. It's a bogus story, man, that they bring to Joseph, saying to Joseph that, hey, um, according to dad, you know, dad's dying wish was that you would forgive us for what we did. That was dad's dying wish. Okay, but here's the problem. Two problems, church family. Number one, Joseph knows that these cats are lying because he was with Jacob in his dying moments. And number two, Joseph has already forgiven these guys. Joseph has already extended mercy to them. And so according to the text right here, Joseph begins to cry. And boy, Joseph begins to weep because he's totally broken over the fact that these guys, his own brothers, still don't believe that he has actually forgiven them. I think it's even crazier, even wackier than that. Look at verse 18. Well, watch this. His brothers also came, watch this. They came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? No, no, I mean, sorry, don't, don't miss this. So, so in other words, these, these dudes are so afraid that Joseph is about to do them in and punish them and put out a hint on their lives that, that for, what, for what, by the way, they did to him 40 years ago, and they're so afraid that Joseph is about to get him back that they actually, according to the text, that they fall on their faces in front of Joseph. And this, you got to understand, this wasn't just an act of honor like, like it was before when they fell on their faces before him. They fall on their faces, and then in addition to that, they cry out, we're your servants, Joseph. We're your servants. In other words, we will do whatever you want us to do. Whatever you say, what we will do. They're throwing themselves at his mercy. They're pledging their lives to Joseph. Okay, but I don't know about you, man, but I so love how Joseph responds here. You you can't miss this. Because immediately, follow this, immediately after these brothers fall down in front of him, do you see what Joseph said? He looks at these guys that are on their faces pledging their lives to him, and he says, 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 guys, do not fear. Am I in the place of God? In other words, Joseph's saying, guys, Get up. Don't be throwing yourself at my mercy. Don't be pledging your life to me. What's wrong with you? I'm not, I'm not God. I'm your brother. I'm not, I'm not God. Now, let's talk. Because just so you know, there's a very simple point that we should all be reminded of 
when we read about this encounter? It's a simple point. And the simple point that we should all be reminded of at this moment is this, church family. People are not to be worshipped. Amen? And we don't talk about this. People are not to be worshipped, and we need to have a conversation about it, church, because I feel like oftentimes what happens is, man, we, we will agree with that. Of course, yes, no, people should not be worshipped. But like functionally, what do we do? Functionally, we tip over into this, I'm this, I'm this uh, compulsive people pleaser. I always have to have other people's approval. And if I don't have other people's approval, then what happens? I go into my, I go into my functional hell, and that is the worst thing I could possibly imagine is to not have the approval of other people. Can anybody relate to this? All the people pleasers in the house say, yeah. yeah. Come on. I should be a rapper. Um, I want to say this, and I want to say this clearly, and I hope you receive it in the spirit in which it's meant, but I feel like it's a big, idea, big, big deal and a really huge idea that we need to unpack, church. There is no person on this earth, young or old, who is worthy to be loved, adored, honored, followed, feared, or worshipped more than the God who knit you together in your mama's womb. None. And too often, man, again, not, the, not what we would say, but the way we function is that we, we put people in the place of God. Family, can I say this? Um, your kids, those of you with kids, um, please hear this. Your kids, cute as they may be, are not worthy of your worship. Your kids, talented as they may be, yay, Billy made all-stars, Billy made all-stars, woo, he's great. yay for Billy, he's not God. Family, listen, your spouse much as you love them, is not worthy to be worshipped. Because they're a sinner. Here she's a sinner. Amen? Come on. Some of the married people are afraid to say amen. You, you know it's true. Listen to me. That celebrity, man, that athlete, that, 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 that politician, none are worthy of your worship. None. Can I also say this in our uh, weird, kind of crazy, uh, Western evangelical culture of uh, celebrity, pop celebrity, church celebrity thing. Can I say this? Pastors aren't worthy of your worship. And if you ever find a pastor who you feel like is worthy of your worship, ask his wife to coffee and talk to her. It's weird, man. It's so good. Dude, let's just think about how goofy that is. Because we do, man. We, we live in this culture in this day and age where it's like you find a pastor. And it's like, well, he got 80 bazillion Twitter followers and everybody in the world listens to his sermon. So he's instant celebrity. And, 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 can, you, can we for a minute think about how goofy that is? Can we think about how goofy and jacked it is to worship a guy who's telling you to worship Jesus? Anybody smell a dead fish? We do it, man. Like, like sometimes it's our kids or sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's just a relationship that we, we care about that a per, person's opinion too much or, or it's a spouse or it's a celebrity or it's a, it's a minister of the gospel. Okay, but, but here's the deal. What happens is, is that we often treat these people as if their word is infallible. They can do no wrong and we will follow them to the ends of the earth wherever they may lead. And before you know it, we're just like Joseph's brothers in Genesis 50 on our faces before for humans saying, we are your servants. We will follow you wherever you may lead us. One of my favorite things to do is to hang out with my daughters and play games with my daughters. I love just being with them and hanging with them. They're, they're fun. They're amazing. They're hilarious. And, um, and we'll play. And I love playing Barbies. I got no problem with playing Barbies. When you got two daughters, you better like playing Barbies. And I got no issue. I'm totally secure playing Barbies. Now, I do have a rule that I always have to be kin it's a standing rule in our house. 
But I'll play Barbies with my girls, man. I'll play board games, right? We play board games a lot with, with our girls. Uh, I'll judge ballet performances, right? The other day, just the other day, this weekend, man, they're doing a ballet performance. We're judging, right? And I'll, I'll sing in the lips, the Frozen soundtrack lip sync com- competition that it seems like we do every day, right? So pray for us, but, but I'll do that. And, and we'll spend time together. We'll, we'll, we'll do all those things. But just so you know, family, just so you know, there is one, there is one game in our home that I cannot stand playing. I can't stomach it. I really can't. I, I loathe this game, and the game is called Candyland. And whenever my daughters want to play it, I will, be- I will do one of two things. I will either beg them to choose a different game, or I will fake like I'm sick. <laughs> I mean, because I, I can't do Candyland. Let me tell you why I can't do Candyland. It's not just because it's Candyland. There's a reason behind it. Um, my problem with the game Candyland, how many of y'all ever played Candyland before? If you play Candyland, you will totally get this and understand this. And maybe you understand my frustration because the problem that I have with Candyland is that in the game Candyland, there is church, there is literally no strategy whatsoever. Like some of you go, I'm a strategic mind. Doesn't matter, you could lose. Doesn't matter. Your competitor can be three and a half years old, you could lose. And here's why. On the game Candyland, um, there's, uh, look at the board, man. There's one path. There's only one path. There's no more than one. There's not even an alternate route halfway between. There's one path, and there's literally one stack of cards you could choose from. Which means, which means, y'all, as soon as the cards have been shuffled, game's already decided. Game's already decided. And it drives me nuts. And I get why Milton Bradley did that. I get that they did that so that it's possible in this universe for a three-and-a-half-year-old to defeat a 40-year-old, but still, it drives me insane. It's completely frustrating because I'm playing a game where there's no, there's no strategy whatsoever. And to me, that seems pointless, man. It's totally pointless. Now, now, here's why I tell you that, Amaze. Let me tell you, let me tell you something else that's pointless. Just so you know, it is pointless to love or adore or worship anything or anyone in this world more than you love, adore, or worship the Lord. It's not, follow this. It's not just dangerous. It's pointless. It, it's futile. It, it's, it's, it's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. It's a chasing after the wind. And here's why. Let me explain that, church. Here's why. Because here's the dirty little secret, Emmaus. Your kids, your children, whom you love with all your heart, and you should love with all your heart, your children will never satisfy your heart the way that the Lord can, but instead they will always ultimately at some point let you down because even even though they're your kids, they're still human, which means they're still sinners. And it's really unfair when you make them your God. Because that's a standard they'll never be able to uphold. You can't. Your spouse will never satisfy your heart the way that the Lord can, but instead your spouse will always let you down because your spouse is human, which means your spouse is a sinner. Your pastors will never satisfy your heart the way that the Lord can, but instead your pastors will always at some point let you down because they're human. And church family, can I just say this? When you look for what only the Lord can provide in fallen human beings who are sinners, you will always end up disappointed and angry and frustrated and disillusioned and it'll be your fault because you decided to ignore God's repeated warnings in the scriptures and you decided to try to get from a fallen, imperfect person what only King Jesus can give to you, which is satisfaction for your soul. Do you see it? So here's the danger, church family. The moment, follow this, say it this way. The moment that I care more about pleasing my kids or pleasing my spouse or pleasing the other people around me more than I care about pleasing King Jesus, that is by definition idolatry and I should repent. And I so love that Joseph gets this, man. I mean, that's the thing. Like, like I read this text and I... I love how Joseph understands this so much so that the Joseph, our boy Joseph, even looks at his brothers while they're on their knees pledging their lives to him. And he says to him, he says, get up, man. I'm not God. What am I in the place of God? You put me in the place of God now? You, you better get up. Me receiving worship from you. God's going to get mad at me. Make my heart blow up or something, right? You better get up. Stop it. I'm not in the place 
of God. And then watch what he says. Amazing. This is so awesome because what, follow this, what we're about to read, family, listen, what we're about to read is um, what, what many scholars who have, who have forgotten more about the Genesis than I've ever read, many Bible scholars believe is the theme verse, not only for this chapter, but for the entire book of Genesis. Like the whole book, the entire narrative from Genesis 1 all the way through, many scholars believe that's it. That's the thing. That's the foundational point that the Lord put here that ties up the entire book. Watch what he says. Genesis 50 verse 20. Watch what Joseph says. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. How amazing is that? Now, there's two things to point out here, church family. Two things to point out. First of all, um, I want you to notice this. First of all, notice, notice how our boy Joseph, um, he doesn't really pull any punches when it comes to talking about what these guys did to him, does he? Do you notice that? Do you notice the words he used here? I mean, and notice Joseph, Joseph literally looks at these cats and he says to him, he says, guys, let's just cut the chase. Guys, you did evil to me. No two ways about it. You did evil to me. Like you acted in an evil way towards me. What you did to me was, was evil. It wasn't unfortunate. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a mishap. It wasn't just something that was too bad. What you did was flat out, no two ways about it. It was evil. Call it what it is. It was evil. You did evil. And family, this is no small thing. This is actually really important. And here's why. I'm going to try to explain this to you the best way I know how. Um, I'll say it this way. In my opinion, one of the most important ministries that a church or a ministry can ever offer to the flock is the ministry of counseling. Counseling matters. Counseling is a big deal. And, and family, you've got to understand this. Um, by definition, counseling means uh, walking with and speaking truth to, right? I mean, that's what counseling is supposed to be. Counseling is supposed to be, I'm walking with you and, and I'm speaking truth to you. Understand, counseling is, is never meant just to be, okay, well, let's just go to Starbucks and I'll hear you out and let you vent and let you talk about how you hate the world and I'll just sip my latte. That is not what counseling is meant to be, Amen. I mean, it's really not. Like, counseling is really meant to be, I'm walking with, I'm talking to. Matter of fact, Jesus himself points out to us that the Holy Spirit is called the counselor. And that's a really big deal. That means, number one, that counseling is really, really important in the life of a church. Counseling matters if even the Holy Spirit is a counselor. And number two, it means that counseling should happen as the Holy Spirit does. What, what does the Holy Spirit do? Walks with us, speaks truth to us, convicts us of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does, right? So, so counseling matters. My point is that counseling matters and counseling should be a part of any church that actually, actually is loving its people, attempting to love its people well. Now, that being said, that there's a piece to counseling, pastoral counseling, that at times grieves me and even frustrates me. And it's this. Um, I don't like... I don't like feeling like you're in a counseling session and, and you're feeling like you have to dance around all the issues and you have to ignore and avoid the big giant purple elephant in the room. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you've got this huge elephant in the room and you've got the issue right there, but you feel like you have to kind of dance around it and scoot about it and you're, you're kind of walking on eggshells and, and there's this thing in counseling sometimes that, 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 that says, well, it, it has to be all fair and balanced, right? It's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be like, like you have to look at this person and say, what did you do wrong? What do you need to own? Okay, great. Thank you. And then you have to look at the other person and say, what did you do wrong or what do you want? And you have to ask all these Socratic questions and you kind of feel like you're playing all these games to kind of set a tone where the person won't not like you, right? And so, so, so you're trying to be all fair and balanced and, and everything else. And I'm going to tell you, as a counselor, oftentimes I don't like that. And here's why I say that, church. You know what I've noticed oftentimes in counseling? What, what I've noticed oftentimes in counseling family is that, is that 80 to 90% of the time, it's, it's not that both parties are at fault at all, but instead, you know what? 80 to 90% of the time, it's just that one of those people is being a jerk. I mean, can we talk or not? 
and I, they're just those moments where I want to I I I just stop and go, guys, guys, okay. I think I know what the problem is. I think I know what the issue is. I got an idea. I got an idea. Um, I think maybe you should stop being a jerk. Can we be honest, church? I mean, like, if that's what counseling is, to walk with, to talk to, to talk about the issue, to actually deal with the issue, then why don't we deal with the issue? I mean, sometimes I, I, I want to sit down with a couple and go, a light bulb just went off. I think I know what the issue is. I think, I think your marriage would get better if you stopped looking at porn. Call it a hunch. My point is this, family. My point is this. Sometimes the problem in your relationship is you. Sometimes it's not that something was done to you and it was wrong and somebody did this and somebody made you do No, no, no. Family, listen. Sometimes the problem is you. Sometimes the common denominator is you. And in those moments, you need to own it completely and not shift blame. I know Adam's been doing that since the garden, but sometimes we need to be humble enough to go, you know what? I'm going to own it. And honestly, here's my point. This is what I love about Joseph right here. This is what I so love about this guy because, because here is Joseph and he looks at these guys and he says, guys, I'm going to be real with you. I'm just going to be honest. What you did to me was evil. I mean, fellas, can we talk? I mean, let's consider this for a minute. You, you sold me. I'm your brother. You sold me for money as a slave. That's Jack. Dude, that's messed up. I mean, let's just talk. What you did is evil. And notice, family, no, notice Joseph doesn't share the blame at all. He doesn't. Joseph, Joseph doesn't say, hey, guys, I get it. Um, matter of fact, I was, I was a cocky and arrogant 17-year-old kid who probably ran my mouth a lot, and so I probably shouldn't have said some of the things I said. And so I kind of get why you maybe would have sold me into slavery. He didn't play that game, church. Instead, Joseph says, guys, let's just be honest. This one's on you. What you did was evil. So we shoot straight, but then notice the second part, family. Notice the second part. It's beautiful. Joseph says, as for you, look at his brother, he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. How awesome is that? Well, let's just hang on that nugget for a second, family. Let's just, let's just hang on the fact that our God is not only so sovereign, but so suave and so slick that he can take evil things, he can turn them around and use them for good. How amazing is that? I mean, Joseph says, yeah, guys, here, what you did was wretched and it was evil and it was messed up, but you know what, guys? You know what? It's cool, and the reason it's cool is because that evil thing that you did, God took it, did something really good. For example, he saved a ton of lives, including all of yours, and he used that evil thing you did. And family, here's the bottom line point I want to get to. Let me be really, really crystal clear. The point that, I don't know if you've been paying attention during this Genesis series, but hopefully you have, because one of the things that we've seen throughout this Genesis series is that the point that God has been driving home to us throughout this entire book is this point right here. Our God is sovereign. He's a king who sits on a throne and he rules and he reigns. Which means God, because he's sovereign, can redeem really ugly things. That's what it means. If God is sovereign, let's use the if-then argument. If God is actually sovereign, if God is actually in control, if it's that beautiful that God actually does sit on a throne and he rules and reigns over everything, then it's true that God can use really ugly things things to do really beautiful things. How awesome is our king? And family, I'm just going to tell you, if, if we would stop long enough, stop, stop like with our busy schedules and always chasing the next hill and my, 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 my crazy schedule, my crazy life, if we would just stop, pause, and reflect long enough, you know what we would see? We would, we would open our eyes and we'd be able to see that God, guess what? God is doing this all the time, y'all. 
All the time, every single day of our lives, you know what God's doing? God's taking really ugly stuff, really wretched stuff, really horrible stuff, where it seemed like there was no hope, and he's turning it around. He's doing really beautiful stuff. It's right in front of your face. You just gotta stop long enough to look around and to see and to make observation, church. You just gotta say time out and stop complaining about the Lord. Stop complaining about all the things that we don't have. Stop complaining about all the things the Lord should do. Stop, look around you, and see all of these different areas where God is taking these these traumatic events, these horrible events, these horrific moments, and he's transforming them into the most beautiful things you could ever imagine. For example, for example, church family, just so you know, this is the reason why, this is the reason why drug addicts and alcoholics can get radically saved and become elders and worship leaders in God's church. This is the reason why couples who were, who were this close to getting divorced, this close to calling it quits, can experience the grace of King Jesus, and years later, not only are they still married, but they're madly in love and co-teaching a marriage class in the local church. Because of this. Because that's who God is. That's what our God does. This is the reason why prostitutes and strippers can get saved, transformed by grace, and become women's ministry small group leaders. Because that's what our God does. Family, this is the reason why a lady who had an abortion when she was young could experience God's grace in the gospel and eventually she herself is counseling young women who are considering abortion and she's pointing them to Jesus, pointing them to scripture, pointing them to the love of Christ and begging them to keep the baby and choose life. Because of this. This is the reason why a couple can have their baby die. And after a period of time, because of that grief and because of that pain that they've had to walk through, they're able to sit down with and counsel people who know that same pain and even lead them to faith in Christ. This is the reason fatherless knuckleheads can become pastors. And family, listen, this is the reason why a bloody and gory and shameful cross, which appears to be the unjust and brutal and hopeless end of a righteous man named Jesus, can eventually become the very symbol of the greatest victory our God ever won. This is the reason why. This is the point, because this is what God does. We have a Father, a Heavenly Father, that we gather here each week to sing to, to worship, to yield our lives to, to learn about, who, who can use really ugly things to do the most beautiful things you could ever imagine. That's what He does. That's who He is. That is the very story of the gospel. That is the story of the Bible. It is amazing to me that the Bible even goes past Genesis chapter 3. Is it not to you? The Bible should be one of the shortest books in the world. God created. It was awesome. God created a man and a woman. God said, hey, don't touch that tree. Don't eat from that tree. The people ate from that tree. Boom, they're dead. The end. Family, this entire book is a redemptive story of an almighty God who took something really, really evil and accomplished the most glorious and beautiful thing we could ever imagine. The salvation of many lives. Incidentally, this is the reason why and church, let me say this to you. I told my, I told my wife the other day, we're having a talk, and I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but it probably will. (laughs) Um, For whatever reason, man, the Holy Spirit has been giving me a deeper love and burden for you as the people of God than ever before in my life. Like I just feel this, this care, like this 
And I guess it's the, I guess it's the heart of the shepherd. I guess, I guess it's a thing that, that pastors are supposed to have. But, 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 I, but I say what I'm about to say to you out of that heart. And what I want to say to you is this, family. When we consider what we just read, that this is who God is, that this is what God does, then I want to say this. Incidentally, this is the reason why you should never, ever, ever, ever lose hope or wave the white flag during a time of intense trial. This is the reason why. As followers of Jesus, we have the hope of glory. And as followers of Jesus, we understand that even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear because the Lord is with us. His rod and staff comforts us. And at the end of the day, no matter how hard things get, we worship the king who consistently brings beauty from ashes over and over and over and over again. That's who he is. That's what he does. And so at the moment we curse God for the trial we're walking through when we turn our backs, it's the moment where we no longer believe that God is who he's declared himself to be. <laughs> Praise God, Raquel. Come on, girl. And just so you know, but incidentally, that's the first time that's ever happened to me when I've ever been preaching in my life. <laughs> and just so you know, I love, I love it, man. I love what Joseph is saying here, man. Because he's, you know what he's saying? Joseph's saying, guys, look, do the math. Let's do the math. So, so you sold me into slavery. This is where I was. I was in jail. I was in prison for 13 years. And now look at where I am, man. I, I am the second most powerful man in Egypt. I can't do this. People can't do this. A man can't pull this off. God did this. And then watch verse 21. And some of you, here's the deal. Some of you walked in here today, and this is what burdens me. Because of something you've done, because of something you've experienced, because of something you've gone through in your life, you feel this intense shame, guilt. It's almost paralyzing at times. But I hope and pray that verse 21 will be freeing for you. Listen to this. So do not fear. Watch what Joseph says to his brothers. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You get this picture? You, 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 you get this picture of Joseph going, guys, guys, listen. Stop it. Get up off your face. Stop it. Listen, I've forgiven you completely. And then he goes on and he, he, he speaks kindly to him. Do you get that picture of speaking I so love that. We don't know what he said, but can you picture Joseph speaking kindly to these guys? Guys, here's the deal. God, man, I love you. Reuben, I love you. Reuben, don't be dumb. I love you. I've forgiven you. I even enjoy you, man. I like hanging out with you. We've been living, we've been living together again for all these years, man. I, I love you. You know what's amazing about you, Reuben? You know what I... He speaks kindly to them and, and, and followers of Jesus. Can I just tell you something? Like if you're in here today and your faith is in Jesus, can I tell you something? Um, I don't know what you've been through or what you've done or what you've experienced in your life, but if your trust is in Jesus Christ as your great God and Savior, here's the gospel truth. You have been forgiven completely. Not mostly, not conditionally, not until the next time you mess up. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have been forgiven completely. So if you've been forgiven completely by Christ, perhaps it's time for you to forgive yourself. And then we end with verse 22. So Joseph remained in Egypt. He and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. Wow. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. In other words, he saw his great, great, great grandkids born. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land, the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. You see the foreshadowing here? It's called the book of Exodus, right? Verse 26. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And honestly, this is kind of hilarious to me when I first read it, man, because, because could there possibly be a more anticlimactic end to the book of Genesis? 
I mean, look, look at that, man. I mean, that's, that's the end of the book of Genesis, which is crazy when we think about it, because think about it. In this book, where we've seen, from, 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 from chapter one, we've seen all these kind of Spiel, Steven Spielberg-esque epic events in this book, like, like God speaks the universe into existence, and, and that moment where, where, where God made a wife for a husband out of his rib, and that moment where there was a worldwide flood that wiped out everybody, and, and there was actually a story in Genesis where a man wrestled an angel, and we had all these incredible stories in the book of Genesis, but how does the book of Genesis end? Basically with a sentence says, yep, Joseph died, they threw him in a casket. The end. Is it? All right, but here's the deal, beloved, just so you know, that's not an accident. Family, listen, it is not an accident the book of Genesis ends this way. It's not. Because can I tell you something? Um, Genesis chapter 50 isn't the ending. It's only the beginning. The story of God's work of redemption in the lives of sinners will continue to unfold for centuries and centuries to come until finally, one day, thousands of years later, that eternal Savior who was promised to Adam and Eve all the way back in the Garden of Eden, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that same eternal Savior will be walking along the shores of the river Jordan in that very same promised land where Jacob insisted on being buried. And that's when this moment would occur. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? But that's another story for another day. Let's pray. And Before we participate in communion as we do every Sunday here at Emmaus, and before we sing a couple songs of response to the Lord, I'm going to ask you two questions to consider. Allow the Holy Spirit to do some work in your hearts. I will just say this. Some of you need to go to the back this morning for prayer before you participate in the Lord's Supper, man. The Lord said, Jesus says, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, man. I want my church to pray, and some of you deeply need prayer because of what you're walking through, and dealing with, and we have a team in the back who's there every Sunday ready to pray with you. I want to ask two questions. If you need prayer in light of these questions, then we invite you to receive it. Question number one is this. I wonder how many of you, much like Joseph's brothers, are having a really hard time believing that you have actually been forgiven? You can't believe that God would forgive you for what you've done, for what you've said, for what you've thought, for where you've been. Can I tell you something? The meat of the gospel says that in Christ, you are completely forgiven. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, all of it. So would you believe the truth of the gospel this morning? Would you press into the truth of the gospel this morning? And those of you who are having a hard time believing that God would love you, forgive you, encourage you to go to the back and be prayed for this morning. If your faith is in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are forgiven completely. The second question I would present to your family is this. Is there something really ugly happening in your life right now that's causing you to doubt God's goodness? You doubt that anything good, anything redemptive can come from it? If that's you, then the question I would pose to you is this, how big is your God? How, how big is your God? Because the God of the gospel is a God who has given us a message. The very message by which we're saved is, of, is a message where God takes the ugliest event we could possibly imagine and turns it around and turns it into the vi biggest victory he has ever accomplished. So Father, I pray for those in our church this morning who are struggling. Lord, we're all sinners. We all fall short, just like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. 
and Joseph and Reuben and Issachar and Simeon. We all fall short. We're all desperately needy for you, Jesus, the grace that you supply. Thank you that you're a merciful God. Thank you that we, those of us who know you were hidden with Christ in God, that there is nothing that could possibly rip us out of your hand. This morning as we worship the same God we read about in the book of Genesis, we remember that just just as you were the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you are the God of Emmaus Church. You are the God of our families. You are the God of us. We worship you for it in Jesus' name.